What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of news to go over, uh, particularly the Chicago Motor Show is going on this week, so lots of reveals there. But before I get to all that stuff, um, one big news story here this week is confirmation of a next generation Mustang. And this comes thanks to Mustang 6G user AMK91, who found a LinkedIn job posting by Ford for a wind, road, noise, and air leakage plant vehicle team engineer um, and that goes on in the description here to say that it's going to be the launch lead for the s650 generation when it launches in 2022 as a 2023 model year vehicle straight from ford so um very awesome and since then the uh job listing has been taken down from linkedin but um, so that gives us the first little nugget of information, you know, so we only have about two years or so to wait here for the new Mustang, which is exciting. Um, and so then forum user on Mustang 6G, uh, Martin JLM, um, added a screenshot from an undisclosed source that, uh, seems to show the S650 starting production on May 1st, 2022. And that's going to be on the same platform as the current S550 generation, which in and of itself was a modified version of the previous generation platform. It hasn't really been all new in a long long time uh, decades in fact so um it can, seems like it's going to continue to be an evolution of that there's been rumors that it's going to be using the cd6 platform from the explorer and the aviator um because those are set up for electrification but if this internal thing from this source here um is correct then it sounds like um the s650 most likely will just be a heavily modified version of the current platform that's adapted to fit all the battery packs and stuff that they're planning for the hybrid Mustang and I'm sure the eventual fully EV Mustang that's coming someday. Um, but it sounds like the S650 is going to just kind of be an evolution of the current car. A heavy evolution should be completely different as far as the looks and the interior and uh, much of the performance could change as well. Um, and uh, But you know, suspension most likely will stay fairly similar. We'll have to wait and see. Thankfully, though, it sounds like we only have about two years to wait for the full reveal, and hopefully we'll see spy mules and stuff um, maybe even late this year or definitely you know, sometime next year. And um, so that's all very, very interesting stuff. By the way, um, in the meantime, though, there is going to be another refresh of the Mustang, and it was spied. You can go over to Mustang 6G. Um, they have pictures there on the, home, on the homepage of the refresh under camouflage. So... Um, as of right now, we can't really see a whole lot, but what we can see is that those turn signals are going to be raised to be even closer to the headlight, and uh, you have a larger opening there in the front bumper, and um, that should be the main change, just bumper change. It looks like lights should stay mostly the same. So think of this as kind of like the refresh that happened in 2013 for the previous generation Mustang before the 2015 Mustang came out. Just the last two years to keep it a little bit fresh until the all new one comes. So that's kind of what to expect here, and since that'll be a 2021 model your vehicle we should be seeing that sometime here in the next couple of months i'm guessing uh, but anyway interesting and um, thanks to mustang 6g for all that info now, for some official Ford news and all the Chicago debuts, the first debut here from Chicago is that Ford revealed uh, an updated version of the GT Supercar for 2020 with an unpainted carbon fiber option called the Liquid Carbon Edition. And so um, that's very, very cool. It does have a clear coat on it still, but uh, no paint. Um, there's also the Golf Racing Heritage Edition that makes a return and gets the new number to reflect the um, the newer vehicle. I think you know the first Golf Edition was based on the 68 cars. Now this one based on the 69 vehicles um other stuff uh bigger news uh is that the engine has been tweaked uh so it now makes 13 more horsepower for a total of 660 horsepower thanks to new gallery cooled pistons higher energy ignition coils and a new tune that gives it a wider torque range supposedly the akrapovich exhaust also uh, that used to be a ten thousand dollar option is now standard meaning all four GTs will be louder as standard. And uh, so yeah, nice updates. Now all four GTs have already been spoken for. So, um, you know, I'm guessing it's just, I guess the people who were lucky enough to get a late order, those are the ones that are getting the updates. So um, kind of an interesting play there. I feel like that would upset some of the um, first two model years of the four GT production and those owners, but uh, I'm sure they're still happy they got a car. Uh, but anyway, interesting there. 
Cadillac has revealed the all-new 2021 Escalade here in uh, this past week, and um, it's on the same platform as the new Tahoe Suburban and Yukon, meaning it now gets an independent rear suspension, optional magnetic ride control, and air suspension, and all the other improvements that came with those vehicles, such as the much larger third row, the larger cargo area, um, much a lot of refinement, lots of new tech and stuff with the rear entertainment system, all that kind of stuff. That all carries over. Engines are all carryovers as well. Um, um, although the smaller V8 from the lower, you know, Suburbans and stuff isn't available. So your only ch- choices are a 6.2 liter V8 or the three liter turbo diesel inline six. that's also available there in the Chevy and the GMC. And I'm surprised they're offering a diesel in the Cadillac, but they say it's refined enough that it can, uh, you know, pass the Cadillac test. Anyway, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like there's going to be any Blackwing V8 version of the Escalade. That was something I know some people were mentioning a few weeks back whenever I was talking about the Blackwing going into, uh, you know, other models and how that's probably not going to happen now and um, it doesn't sound like the Blackwing will find a home in the Escalade either unfortunately but both the 6.2 liter V8 and the diesel are going to be running the 10 speed automatic the same one again from the Chevy and the GMC exterior styling changes uh, a little bit depending on the trim with more bright work on the luxury and platinum trims but a blacked out look on the sport models the interior is more high tech than the Navigator which is its main competitor but still doesn't seem quite as luxurious from a material standpoint obviously I would have to see one in person to make a full assessment. But um, the main feature here is three different displays that are all curved OLED displays. And this is, I think, the first use of curved OLED displays in a car. Um, Usually that's just stuff you see in TVs and phones and stuff. And so that's pretty high tech. Um, The infotainment screen is 16.9 inches. The digital gauges are a 14.2 inch screen. And then there's an additional screen on the left there that's 7.2 inches. The infotainment uh, screen there is a touch screen, but has a controller too, if you like that better. It also has an available 36 speaker studio reference stereo made by AKG, which is a company that's never done a car stereo before, but um, clearly they must do a very good job considering it's um, you know supposed to be competing with all the top systems out there. Uh, the rest of the interior looks pretty close to other Cadillacs, meaning it's nice, but definitely not best in class nice again, in my opinion. One feature though that is best in class though is that Super Cruise is going to be available. And like I mentioned last week, whenever um, they um, revealed this, the automated lane change feature in Super Cruise is gonna be also uh, coming here this year to all these models. And so this means you have the, the act the only still the only truly hands-free driving experience um, as far as adaptive cruise control systems go and uh, having the automated lane changes to go along with that brings it uh, still to the forefront as far as you know the automated driver assist technology goes and uh, so very very impressive still not autonomous but you know I think Cadillac is the closest so far and so that's uh, pretty impressive there and so yeah otherwise you know it gets all the other stuff like um, you know from the Yukon and the Suburban where you have like the rear view cameras where there's several different angles so it can make your trailer look like it's uh, not there or you can see through your trailer Um, so you know towing and stuff should be better here in the new Escalade thanks to all that new tech as well. Uh, There isn't any pricing yet for these but they should be going on sale late 2020 so cool to see that. Toyota this week uh, brought back the XSE trim for the Highlander for the 2021 model year. It gives it a more aggressive bumper set up front and rear along with some lower side skirts to round out the sporty look. It also gets a sportier suspension setup with stiffer springs, shocks, and a roll bar along with a retuned steering setup but I guess it'll probably be a little bit heavier. It runs the same V6 and 8-speed auto as the other versions of the Highlander. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's going to be available with the hybrid though. Uh, available though with either front wheel drive or the torque factoring all wheel drive system from the limited and platinum trims. The interior gets some trim that looks similar to carbon fiber but it isn't genuine carbon fiber or anything. I also get black leather red seats as standard but you can upgrade to red leather seats if you'd like. So these are going to be going on sale this fall but no pricing yet for that but um, you know that was one interesting thing you know when I reviewed the Highlander just uh, you know about two months ago here um, there was no XSE trim or any sportier trims it was just the luxurious ones and um, now now we know why they were holding that back until the 2021 version instead of the 2020s like the other Highlanders. But anyway, interesting to see that. And for some other Toyota news very briefly, um, they have a new trail edition and nightshade editions um, for many of their models here. So the trail editions are for the Tacoma, Tundra, and 4Runner. They're based on the SR5 trim, so they're a little bit lower, you know, cloth seats and stuff. Um, and despite the name, they aren't going to be as off-road prepped as the TRD models, which sit higher up in the range. Um, the main features here 
here you get a lockable storage bin on the sides of the beds there. Uh, the driver's side bin is insulated. You can use it as a cooler. It also has a 115 volt outlet in the bed too. So this sounds more like a camping or tailgating version of these models, more so than a, you know, like actually driving on a trail. Um, on the Forerunner though, the package does also get you a roof basket among many other small things. There's also other trim stuff. They get different grills and wheels and small stuff like that, but I'm kind of glazing over it because there's so much news this week. Um, and so anyway, those will be available this summer. There's also the new Nightshade editions. Those are coming for the Sequoia, Tacoma, and Tundra and are limited to just 5,000 units each for uh, the trucks and 2,500 units for the Sequoia. They're based on the limited trim, so it's a little more luxurious there. It's basically just uh, darkening or blackening out all the trim and the wheels and that's basically it. Jeep revealed the Gladiator Mojave. So it's the first desert rated Jeep um, and is designed for higher speed off-roading instead of the low speed stuff that the Rubicon is designed for. And so the Mojave gets unique Fox remote reservoir shocks that are stiffer and should give a sportier on-road feel as well as off-road abilities um, and that high speed off-road ability in particular. Uh, the chassis has been uh, reinforced more than the Rubicon they say as well. It has an additional one inch lift in the front and hydraulic jounce shocks along with 33 inch tires as standard um, and so all this combines to give the best approach and departure angles of any Gladiator. It also uh, runs only the V6 and you get the option of either the manual or the automatic transmission uh, that puts the power to the ground uh, through a 2.72 to 1 transfer case um, and so that allows some higher speeds in the low range and also it gives you the, the Mojave version gives you an off-road plus mode that allows you to lock the rear differential in four-wheel drive high mode usually you can only do it in four-wheel drive low otherwise it gets a unique hood scoop and graphics skid plates and rocker guards uh, it's gonna be on sale this spring but there isn't any pricing for those yet and they didn't announce a Mojave version for other models, but I'm guessing that's not too far off, at least maybe for the Wrangler, but we'll have to wait and see. As of right now, it's just for the Gladiator. Uh, but Jeep also did reveal a new high altitude trim for the Wrangler and for the Gladiator, which basically gives you the most street friendly and luxurious versions of each of these models with painted bumpers and fenders and more street friendly tires, along with making uh, most of the optional equipment as standard. So this is really for someone who wants a fully loaded, super luxurious, street friendly version of these Jeeps. And uh, there's a lot Lots, lots of those people. So good that they're offering that, uh, but no official details as far as pricing or anything for those yet. Nissan this week threw everyone a curveball by revealing the 2020 Frontier, which as you can see is the same old truck from before, but gets a new engine and transmission that they say is going to be the one used in the actual new Frontier that Nissan has confirmed is coming next year. So literally one year away and uh, they went to the trouble of swapping in this engine and transmission into the old truck. I don't understand why, especially with Nissan struggling financially, I don't know how this would make sense to you know spend all this money to um, certify the engine and put the engine in the old truck. Maybe it was a very easy bolt-in swap and they figured why not. I don't know why they went to all this trouble. It's still really a head scratcher to me. Anyway, it is here and the new engine, we have all the details on it. It's a 3.8 liter natural aspirated v6 i think it's basically a heavily reworked version of the four liter v6 in the current frontier they say like 93 percent of the parts are either new or redone so i think that it's kind of a variation of that engine but it's much more efficient supposedly it does 310 horsepower and 281 pound feet of torque but still ford's getting that much power out of their little turbocharged 2.3 liter four cylinder all the other competitors, you know, use four cylinders or V6s that are smaller. Um, so I still feel like this engine, once the fuel economy numbers come out, might be behind all the other competitors as far as fuel economy goes. We'll have to wait and see though, no official numbers yet. The engine does have direct injection at least, so it is improved a little bit in that way. Um, the nine speed auto they say is similar to the one in the Titan, but I have a hard time believing it's that different. It's probably fairly similar. Um, other things here um, is that uh, there's some other changes for the 2020 frontier again not sure why they're doing that now but um it shows just how ancient this truck is with the changes here's the new standard features for the frontier for 2020 
power windows, power door locks, a tilt steering wheel, a leather shift knob, and push button start. Push button start is a little bit of a later addition, but I feel like basically everything else has had power windows and locks um, for at least the past 10 years. But I'm glad they're adding it better late than never, I suppose. But again, I honestly would just have waited for the all new version. Anyway, these are gonna be available in rear wheel drive or four wheel drive versions still. Um, but another change for the 2020 version is that the four cylinder option is gone and so is the manual transmission option meaning the only truck left in America with a manual transmission I believe is the Tacoma at least as far as you know normal passenger trucks go so um, pretty crazy there and I'm guessing that means that you know there won't be a manual or a four-cylinder option for the new Frontier next year or maybe there will be something and they're just deciding to you know make it a little more streamlined with the options here for 2020 I don't know but uh, anyway interesting uh, development there from Nissan uh, Chevy this week revealed the refreshed 2021 Equinox uh, which gets tweaked styling front and back mechanically it's the same though with the option of either the 1.5 liter engine with the six-speed auto or the two liter with the nine speed auto. There were some rumors that the nine speed auto was gonna be on both engines, but it sounds like they didn't go to the trouble of doing that. So you still have that old six speed auto for the slower engine. There is a new RS trim though, which gives it a darker and sportier look and even has quad exhaust tips, um, which is an interesting thing. Um, the optional safety tech um, is gonna be uh, available in lower trims now they're saying as well, which is kind of nice because previously it was like you to go up to really high trims to get even some basic safety stuff. Um, uh, but things like automatic emergency braking and lane keep assist are standard now. Um, so that's good that they include that. And um, yeah, Chevy also included, they've sold almost 350,000 Equinox just last year. Um, so they are still selling a ton of these things. Um, and it still isn't the best selling vehicle. I think the RAV4 and the CRV still outsell it, but um, you know, it's still, there's someone a ton of these. And uh, anyway, this new one's gonna be available this fall. Volkswagen has revealed the 2021 Atlas. And so this is the refresh for the Atlas, but it is a, a decent bit changed. Um, and so you can see it borrows heavily from the Atlas Cross Sport that was just revealed um, back in LA in November. And so the whole front end is new with these sharper headlights, wider grill, it has a more aggressive bumper. The back end gets slightly smaller taillights and a restyled rear bumper there too. But the bumper changes actually make the refreshed Atlas almost three inches longer than it was before. Uh, the interior gets a new steering wheel. That's the main change. Otherwise, there's just more standard tech with every trim except the base model. Now getting the eight inch touchscreen. I'm not sure what, I guess they get some smaller screen in the base model, but other stuff here. Uh, traffic jam assist is now available for the adaptive cruise control system as an option. And uh, both the four cylinder turbo and the V V6 engines uh, are carrying over in return, but you can now get the four cylinder engine with all wheel drive for the first time, which is nice. Cause usually it was if you didn't want the V6, then you were forced into front wheel drive with the four cylinder. Um, so now you can get all wheel drive for those. And anyway, they're all gonna be on sale this spring. So cool to see that. And Hyundai revealed the hybrid version of the 2020 Sonata, um, which is actually kind of cool. So it's pretty impressive uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's just very efficient and a little bit more high tech than some other hybrids out there. So it's gonna be getting 50 MPG in the city, 52 combined and 54 MPG on the highway and has a range of 686 miles on the most efficient trim. Um, and so the setup is basically the same as the last Sonata hybrid mechanically at least, meaning get a two liter naturally aspirated four cylinder and a 30 kilowatt or 39 kilowatt uh, electric motor for 192 horsepower total. It runs through an updated six speed automatic, which um, is an odd choice considering all the other Sonatas now run an eight speed automatic. And I would assume that would be more fuel efficient or even a CVT like many other hybrids use, but uh, Hyundai is sticking with the uh, six speed automatic for some reason. That's kind of strange, but um, it still gets really good fuel economy. So it's whatever. But the main standout feature to me is that this has a solar panel roof um, that Hyundai says can provide about two miles of extra range each day or about 700 free miles per year and they're assuming about six hours of sunlight there each day so obviously in some more cloudy places you won't get that much but um, still uh, you know obviously there isn't much electric range since it's a you know not a strong electric motor or anything but um, you know means you can have extended stop start and a lot of that stuff you might uh, not even have to be recharging the battery you just get 
get it from the sun, which is kind of cool. Um, so there isn't any pricing or launch date yet for these, but I'm sure it should be coming fairly soon. It's a cool to see that. Kia has revealed the refreshed 2020 cadenza for America, and it looks the same as the Korean K7 version that came out over six months ago in Korea. So um, it's the same thing here. We're just getting it a little bit later. It looks great though with some nice changes. Front and rear really looks a lot sharper to me. Uh, looks really good. The interior also gets a nice improvement with the new 12 inch infotainment screen from the K900 and the Telluride and a restyled center stack to accommodate it. There's also more USB jacks now, a faster wireless charging pad, and Kia's drive-wise safety tech is now standard, including uh, their blind spot camera system that uh, is very cool. That also includes, as standard, their adaptive cruise control with steering assist and more. So awesome, they include all that. They also have made improvements to the structure, they say, to make it quieter and more refined inside. And so these should be available soon, I'm guessing, since it's labeled as a 2020 model vehicle, so they should be on sale any day now, I'm guessing. Uh, but cool to see that. Chrysler this week at Chicago revealed the heavily refreshed 2021 Pacifica. So it adds all wheel drive for the first time in 16 years while still keeping the stow and go seats. So that's the big news there. Um, but unfortunately that all wheel drive system is not available with the plug-in hybrid model. It's only on the front wheel drive version still. Um, it can send 100% of the power to the rear if necessary, uh, but it's controlled automatically of course, like most all wheel drive systems these days. It can also disengage when not needed for better fuel economy Economy. And um, otherwise, the styling is uh, really nicely sharpened up here on the new Pacifica, in my opinion. Uh, especially up front there, you get those uh, standard daytime running lights that are LED and look good. And uh, the back end now gets uh, wide taillights that connect in the middle there. Inside, it gets uh, the first application of FCA's new Uconnect 5 into infotainment system in this larger 10.1 inch display now that's standard on all models. And if you're curious to hear about that uh, infotainment system, I talked about the software and everything in last week's weekly updates you can go watch that if you're curious um, other new tech though is there's a fam cam feature uh, that allows the front occupants uh, to see those in the back seats and even can zoom in on individual seats so if you want to zoom in on one kid in particular or whatever uh, to see what's going on you can so that's a, I think it could be a handy feature for families there's also a new top pinnacle trim that has tan Napa quilted leather seats and matching pillows even for the second second row there so both the regular v6 and the plug-in hybrid v V6 models are carryovers, so no changes there mechanically. Um, and uh, lots of standard safety equipment, including LED headlights, automatic emergency braking, blind spot monitoring, and even adaptive cruise is all standard on the Pacifica. Um, so keep in mind, they do now have the Chrysler Voyager as the like cheaper minivan, and uh, I don't believe that is going to be getting any styling changes, and I think that's still front wheel drive only. I think it's just the Pacifica that gets all these standard features and the new looks, um, at least for now. Uh, but anyway, these new Pacifica are going to be starting to arrive by early fall for the launch edition all-wheel drive versions. Basically, they want to make sure that anyone who wants an all-wheel drive Pacifica will be able to get it uh, before winter time. So that's kind of cool. And so, yeah, great improvements there. Uh, but that's it for all the Chicago stories. But for uh, one other FCA story this week, there's a strong rumor going around about a Durango Hellcat. And um, it's basically confirmed. Um, there's a new Dodge commercial that debuted along with the Fast 9 trailer, and uh, there's a brief shot that shows a very tall Fender with a Hellcat badge. And, um, you know, this is a Dodge commercial, so it's got to be a Dodge, and um, all we have is, you know, Charger and Challenger, and this is definitely not one of those, so it's clearly the Durango. And the next shot, they show a very blurry picture of a Durango with a hood scoop. Um, and so there has been, I think, some spy shots of a more aggressive of Durango running around last year and that sounds like this is what we're going to get. I mean it makes total sense. There's lots of people that would love it I'm sure and they already have everything already set up from the Jeep Trackhawk with the all-wheel drive system that can now handle you know the Hellcat engine and stuff so just swap over the Trackhawk stuff into the Durango and you're set. You have the officially I think the fastest three-row crossover most likely whenever it does debut. Um, speaking of that debut though uh, Motor Authority says that their Dodge Insider confirmed this is happening and will be revealed at the New York Auto Show in April so we only have a couple more months to wait for that so uh, that's that's gonna be awesome. I love they're just putting the Hellcat motor and everything. Dodge is just the coolest uh, so that's awesome. 
awesome. Um, one vehicle, though, that might not be coming for a good while is the Next Generation Mini Cooper. So just a few months ago, you know, they were talking about the Next Generation version, what they'd like to do with it and stuff. Uh, but now, according to a report by Reuters, um, it has been put on hold. Um, and so a BMW spokesperson explained that the lifespan of this platform has been extended for cost reasons and because of Brexit. So many of the minis are still built in the UK, and I think they're trying to figure out, you know, that whole thing and how things are going to go down for them politically with Brexit and stuff. So um, hopefully they can figure all that stuff out and, you know, continue to keep mini viable because uh, they're really cool little vehicles. I really like the electric Mini Cooper that I just reviewed last week. Those are um, very, very fun and a really good little commuter car and a really good value as well. So anyway, uh, but yeah, if you're curious about waiting for a new Mini, don't bother waiting. It's going to be a long wait, I think. So just go for a current one and you'll be good. Um, the last news here, though, other uh, UK news is uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has announced a new proposal to ban the sale of new gas and powered and gas and diesel powered vehicles by 2035 um, and so this isn't finalized yet so um, it still has to get approved through other various uh, things before it actually uh, becomes law but if it does go through even hybrids won't be allowed um, only electric vehicles so this is only for new vehicles though so that means that up until the year 2034 they can continue to sell gasoline powered new vehicles 2035 you just if you want a gas powered vehicle you just have to buy used and you'll have literally the next 15 years of vehicles to pick from in addition to everything that's currently on the market so um yeah those who don't want an ev even 15 years from now could still go back and get something older if they'd like so um you know and i think they said they could even move up that goal potentially if they can get the charging network and stuff ready to go fast enough um and so, you know, I think for the, a, a country like the UK, it makes sense more so because there's, um, you know, the whole country is, you know, less, you know, not super, super long. It's there's not a lot of miles to cover. And so you can go from one end of the UK to the other and probably only have to charge once or twice. So, um, you know, I think it makes sense, especially for, you know, areas like that. So, um, you know, we'll see if they can actually put that into law and, you know, how it goes over. But a very interesting development there and just goes to show that um, even if it doesn't go through it will eventually electric is just the way things are going to go um, and uh, so yeah it's interesting times we're living in but yes that's it for all the news this week guys so let me know your thoughts and everything in the comments below thank you guys very much for watching and i'll see you on the next one take care